Uh, great. Now people will be able to hear my voice. Um, and now share a screen. So it's going to be this one. Share. We got it. We got it. Good. Uh, let me get my Zoom screen back up. Uh, that's not going to happen. Okay. So metering and the zone system. So the, this is a little bit of an advanced topic. So I'm hoping uh, most of you will have uh, a bit of uh, definitely a strong knowledge of shooting in full manual. Um, if you don't, though, or if you have questions, um, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. In fact, if I could have somebody kind of uh, keep an eye on uh, chat and stuff like that, and if I miss it, uh, just stop me. But um, yeah, don't hesitate to uh, break in and ask questions as this goes along. So starting off, uh, metering is, uh, let's get this thing going. There we go. Uh, metering. So we've got a setting on our camera where we can change our metering modes. And this is going to change them from where it's basically looking at the entire uh, view screen to where we're just looking at a very, very small part and a little bit of everywhere in between. So the question is, well, what should I normally keep it to? And honestly, uh, that's going to be a pretty easy decision. So starting off, the metering modes at a glance, uh, we start normally start off with evaluative or matrix metering. Uh, your camera may call it a little something different, but that's the newest version of metering for most cameras, digital cameras. And where it's looking at the entire screen view screen of what we're taking a picture of but what makes it a little bit more unique away from what our cameras used to do back in the olden days is the fact that it actually will put more weight more emphasis around it the area that we're focusing and so if it picks up a focus point let's say we're working in the rule of thirds and it picks up a focus point down into the lower um, left-hand section of the image, and it says, okay, there's the focus point there. Well, then it kind of shifts the, uh, the ratio or the amount of um, weight that it puts to that area more around that focus point. This is really nice because if you're if you know if you are working in the rule of thirds or something like that, and it should pick up something over on one side, instead of doing it like most of our cameras did years ago, where it actually put more metering towards the center or not at all, it just basically took the entire screen, evened it out, and said, okay, that that's it. This way, it really does make a difference on. Uh, adjusting, you know, how much weight goes to a particular area when it's trying to evaluate what is the best recommendation or to get the best photograph here, okay? Get the correct exposure for what I'm trying to take a picture. So if you've got something over there, it only makes sense to put more weight to that area in making that evaluation of getting the correct exposure in a particular area. Now, again, that's called evaluative or matrix metering. From there, we go to what's called center weighted, uh, where basically it does take, as you can see, the darker the color, the more weight to an area that is being considered. So in this that type of situation, you see where it's picking up more of the center area. And as it goes out from the center, it takes less consideration to those outer areas. Partial metering, very strong in the center. In fact, it's not really looking at the outer sides of the viewfinder at all, down to what we call spot metering. Now, if you ever want to make uh, taking pictures really, really hard, put your camera on spot metering, not know it, 
and watch the needle just kind of bounce around as you're trying to do uh, manual metering. Because as you move your camera the least little bit, that needle is going to jump around quite a bit. So, so always make sure you've got your camera on the correct uh, metering for the type of photography that you're doing. Like I said, uh, for the most part, uh, evaluative or matrix meeting works well in most conditions. There are some times that we want to use spot metering and that we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, my primary photography even today is still uh, portrait photography. Uh, I do a lot with off-camera flash, um, wedding photography, event photography, that type of stuff. That's still my kind of go-to type thing. Um, seniors, I, I love photographing seniors, not old people like me, although they're, they're fine too, but you know, uh, senior photography is a lot of fun. Um, at, like I said, different cameras will have different, uh, metering modes and I've got, you know, some of the major players here, what they call it, uh, and what the symbol is going to be. Uh, this is going to be something when you have a chance, grab your camera, pull it out, try to find your metering mode, uh, because this will, again, this is something that's going to be able to help you as you move along. As you look at a scene, uh, this would be kind of the way your camera would see uh, the same scene in three different metering modes. So evaluative or matrix metering, it's going to look at the whole thing. But again, uh, in this particular instance, it would put more weight towards the center because that's where your focus point probably is going to be. Center weighted, it puts a lot of weight towards the center, spot metering pretty much dead center. Uh, actually, I do use spot metering uh, some when I'm doing uh, okay. portraits and stuff, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what kind of meter does our camera actually have? Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So our camera has what's called a reflective meter in it. Uh, our camera has a meter that's going to basically record the light being reflected off of our subject okay well there's another type of meter out there and i actually uh carry one of these around with me most of the time okay uh this is called an incident meter and an incident meter is actually reading the light coming to our subject and there's a good reason why uh to have this now if you're doing again if you're doing um landscapes, uh, things of that nature, uh, the standard reflective metering is going to do fine. If you're doing portraits, uh, if you're doing macro, uh, things where you're getting really close up to something, the incident meter can really help you. So does anybody know kind of one of the issues with reflective metering? Anybody? Quiet group. So. We'll get to that, just kind of keep that in mind. So incident meters have been around forever, okay? In fact, back in the olden days, a lot of cameras didn't have meters in them at all. And so you'd have to have an incident meter that you carried with you to kind of get your meter. In fact, uh, the meters then would be able to read both reflective and incident both. Um, so some of you may have seen some of these old type meters like the Luna Pro, uh, I actually have one of those, uh, but they're still around today. They just look different. And a lot of them are digital, make it easier to read and easier to work. So even today, our incident meters, again, you could have something that's digital or they still make the analog look to a meter uh, like the Sekonic. Sikon meters are really really nice um but this one this particular one still has that uh older look to it, that analog type of look so because of how reflective meters work they came out with a system 
some of you actually may know this man. He's uh, not maybe personally, but you know of him. Uh, and he is the one that came out with the zone system. Okay. Uh, this was a way for us to be able to figure out how to work with reflective meters against uh, the current types of uh, photography or what we'd be taking pictures of today because of the reflective values. Okay, the reflective values are different for a lot of different things. This is kind of the crutch or the issue with reflective meters is the fact that different things reflect light differently. Okay, so if you're taking a picture of somebody in, uh, you know, a Caucasian bride in a white dress against a white backdrop, that's going to give you a totally different uh, meter reading than, say, taking kind of a low key portrait of somebody against a black backdrop. Okay, even though the lighting may be almost identical in both situations the camera's gonna read it differently because of the reflective light, okay? So that becomes the problem. And we talk about the zone system from Ansel Adams. So I've got a bigger uh, picture of this, but this is something that uh, I just wanted to kind of show you. So we normally talk about working with between zone three and zone seven, okay? Those three, because this is the these particular zones between three and seven are with detail, okay? These are blacks with detail and zone uh, seven are whites with detail. If I'm taking a picture of a bride on a white dress and I wanna have detail in that dress, I wanna make sure that dress is in a zone seven. Uh, and what our cameras are always striving to shoot four is zone five, 18% gray. So I don't know if any of you've ever seen uh, someone out shooting and they'll pull out a gray card. Uh, that is a way to, if you put that in front of your camera, center the needle on that, and that's you know shooting manual where you're gonna center the needle uh, right here in the center of the, uh, at zero, okay? If you do that on a 18% gray card, that's going to assure you that that is absolutely perfect exposure. Now, the problem is, okay, so let's say I center the needle, 18% gray card. Now I bring my subject in. Now my needle is no longer centered. So a lot of people would say, oh, lighting's changed. I need to change my settings now. The lighting did not change. And we actually, I call this, or a lot of people will call this, chasing the needle. And what you're doing is the exposure has not changed. What's changing is the reflective value of whatever you're taking a picture of. So if I were to center the needle on 18% gray and bring in a black card, well, now it's going to show. Uh, terribly underexposed. If I bring a white card in, it's going to show terribly overexposed, where actually it's not in either case. And when we change our exposure to try to center the needle again in manual, we're actually chasing the needle. So the one thing I wanted to show in this instance for the five different zones that we mainly deal with for detail. If you look at your exposure meter on your camera, you actually, if you go from negative two to plus two, well, there are your five zones. Uh, in fact, a lot of cameras used to only go from negative two to plus two, uh, and those were mainly for the five different zones with detail. Okay. How are we doing? Questions? I think, Michael, I think Michael's got one. Michael's got one. <laughs> yeah, um, Mike, going back to the situation that you were talking about earlier, 
with the um, bride in a white dress, light skin, and um, the background. Um, and you describe that other lighting situation. Well, with the, if you're using an incident meter and you're using that meter in the light where both of them are standing, wouldn't you get the same kind of um, readings on that incident meter? Yes, and that is the beauty of an incident meter. The incident meter is not fooled by reflective values like your camera is. If you are a person that likes doing portraits or, again, macro or things like that, an incident meter to me is invaluable because you're normally up closer to things. Now, with landscapes, you're further away. You've got a lot of different tones that your camera can even out to give you the correct exposure. And the reflective value issue is not as prominent. But when you're photographing, uh, like, again, like what I do or used to do a lot of weddings, um, I might have a situation where I have groomsmen that are all in black tuxes. Well, that totally throws the meter off and my image ends, ends up being overexposed. So I have to... Your, your reflective meter, right? Reflective meter, camera. the one in oh. the camera, the reflective gotcha. meter okay. in the camera is fooled. And <laughs> so that's one of the nice things about having that incident meter because it's not. Okay. Because it's not getting the reading off of the reflection of the light. It's getting the meter uh, meter reading of the light coming to the subject. And it makes all the difference in the world. Okay. And I Thanks, and so. I make sure I I add macro photography into this mix because um, you know there's a lot more people probably in this group into macro photography or things like that than portrait photography. So so anyhow, um, so yeah, uh, negative two to plus two, that's normally our you know zone three. Zone four, zone five is at zero. Zone six is plus one and zone seven is plus two. Okay, and I'll get into why that's important here in a second. So many, many years ago, and some of you may have actually had a chance to go to these, was the Rocky Mountain School of Photography, their digital weekends. Did anybody ever go to those? No? Oh, man, that's a shame. Uh, so they used to come to Atlanta and other surrounding cities. Uh, one year they had one up in uh, Asheville, and it was really cool. But basically, they'd come in, uh, and Saturday and Sunday, they'd have two courses of classes. They'd have a uh, class that was more for intermediate, and they'd have a beginner kind of classes that you could take. <clears throat> so excuse me so anyhow i got this back then and this is years and years and years old and basically this is kind of telling me what things i can expect to put in these these different zones now again these are zones that are with detail so very dark with detail black dark brown navy blue with detail uh dark fur of Bison, bears, dogs, and other dark animals. So <clears throat> basically what this is saying, let's say I was taking a picture of a black lab. I don't center the needle. So I'm using the reflective meter in my camera and I'm zooming in on it. I don't want to center the needle. So many of us have been told, center the needle for your manual, for your manual exposure, okay? I taught it that way for years and years and years, but you have to take in the reflective value. And so for very dark with detail, I'd actually put the needle at negative two. And that is correctly exposing for that reflective value. Uh, royal blue, uh, purple, burgundy, dark red, dark green, that's a zone four. This is the one that you can actually center your needle on. 
zone five. Eighteen percent gray card. And back in the day shooting film, I kept one in my bag all the time. Uh, lighter blue, medium reds or green, dark orange, most grass. So this is actually works very well. I've been out, say, shooting soccer. I'll get a meter reading off of the grass. I center the needle. I will then take a picture, a few pictures of some of the players. I make sure that I don't have any blowouts. I do that with the blinkies. How many people know what the blinkies are? Highlight alert. Your best friend, I tell you. That is one thing you want to make sure you have on is your highlight alert. And basically, it will show you when you are shooting and you have stuff that is too bright. In fact, for digital photography, there's a saying. You shoot for the highlights and you let the shadows take care of themselves. You shoot for the highlights and you let the shadows take care of themselves. In other words, you want to make sure that your highlights are not blown out. And then you could always fix your shadows post-processing. If your highlights are blown out, you're done. I see this so much with uh, nature photography, especially around here with waterfalls. Somebody will be taking a long exposure of a waterfall. And the whites will be blown out to the point that there's no detail in them at all. It's really easy to figure out. Have your highlight alert on, look at it after the shot, and make sure it's not blinking. If you're not familiar with the highlight alert, please look it up after this meeting. Turn it on. Learn how to use it. It will be your friend. Okay? The blinkies. Um, so zone five. Zone six, pastels. Uh, pinks, yellows, very light reds, greens, uh, lighter skies of sunset, sunrise, and Caucasian skin. I was saying earlier that I use spot metering. If I'm not using an incident meter, I use spot metering because what I will do is spot meter off of the brighter part side of someone if I'm shooting someone that is Caucasian and make sure that I'm one stop over plus one. That would work for zone six. Zone seven is the easiest white with detail. If I'm photographing a dress, I want to make sure it is two stops, a plus two. And that is the same thing as centering the needle. It is the exact same thing. Because what it's doing is taking in the reflective value component of what you're photographing. Okay. Like I said, this is definitely on the higher scale of, you know, figuring some stuff out because you've got to know uh, manual photography pretty well. And then this is kind of like the step after that. Uh, the first time I heard about this, my wife was with me. Uh, we were both sh uh, shooting weddings as a team at the time. Uh, we walked out of the, out of this particular uh, seminar and we looked at each other and we go, what? It definitely took a little while to uh, figure it all out because, you know, like I said, center the needle. That's the only thing we'd ever been taught. Questions? How many people have heard about the zone system before? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Good. How many people use it pretty regularly in their photography? Melissa's sitting here going, nope. And, and it really determine. it's really because it's, it's really the type of photography you do will determine how much you actually use this. Again, for the type that I do, it comes in really handy. So here's a situation where getting the correct exposure, sorry, it's not something really, really exciting. This was just a uh, uh, Rose of Sharon bush or something like that. Uh, that I have out in the yard. So taking pictures of it. And so is this shot, is this uh, correctly exposed? Looks okay. By the histogram, it looks okay. Um, 
So anyhow, we kind of took this and kind of played around with it from there. So the first thing I did was throw a black card in here, not changing any of the settings, just putting a black card in here, taking a picture of it. Well, that is not black. Uh, so that's telling me that something was not good on that initial shot. So this is not correctly exposed. And if I think about the zone system here, instead of this being down two thirds of a stop, it actually should be down closer to negative two. So this is, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so this is definitely overexposed a little bit. Um, if I had centered this needle, well, that would even make it more overexposed. So you can see by centering the needle on this card, this is where the reflective value is not working well. Went to a white card, wow. So that's really bright. Same settings, just, to, just put the card in, took a picture of it, and this is over three stops overexposed. I couldn't even see the needle. So it was definitely way, way off. So then we brought in the white card and we centered the needle on the white card. My white balance was way off. So he fixed the white balance and it was just about centered, but that's not white. In fact, that's gray. So again, that's what the camera, camera was doing. It was actually switching the white to gray because it wasn't properly exposed. It was trying to make it 18% gray, and it pretty much did it. So with the white card exposed almost dead center, yeah, that doesn't look white at all. It should have been plus two. That would have given the card that you know the correct thing. And from there, we pulled the card out and took a shot of the original image again. We can see that this is terribly, terribly underexposed, not looking well at all. So by, again, centering on the white card, it didn't give us the correct exposure. So then we tried something a little different. I don't know if any of you have ever used one of these or not. It's called a calibration target. So a calibration target is black, 18% gray, and white. What that gives you on your histogram are three spikes, one for the black, one for the 18% gray, and one for the white. So this is pretty well correct exposure here, okay? This is what a calibration target looks like. Um, I've had mine for years and absolutely love it. For photographing, again, portraits and stuff, this thing is great. I take one shot of this, I get my needle centered up, and then I can use the other side act actually for a reflector. Again, the reflectors also could be used, again, for macro and stuff like that uh, to get some more light coming in at a different angle on your flowers or whatever. So. It's not just that flat lighting that we see so many times on macro photography. So once, now that I've got the correct exposure, we take the shot again, and now it's properly exposed. So I've put this, the meter in there to check, and that's exactly what my exposure was. So the question is, this was actually the correct exposure. This was the original image in the lower left-hand corner. Honestly, I like it a little overexposed. Um, in fact, I know a lot of you probably know Barry, uh, our, our best guy for fixing our cameras and stuff. Uh, Barry and I talked about it because I normally shoot at about two thirds of a stop overexposed almost always. And he said, well, that's a good thing. He said, just making sure that you're not blowing out your highlights by shooting overexposed a little bit actually gives you more data. You have less noise and better colors. I didn't know if, how many of you actually know that. Uh, 
That's a little something from Barry, and it's true. So again, we want to check those, um, make sure you've got that highlight warning on. Shoot just a little bit overexposed. That's going to give you better colors, less noise. Uh, but to really get your uh, best exposure, think about the zone system uh, for a lot of your imagery, or even uh, if you're the type of imagery, if it works for it. Look at possibly getting an incident meter. So questions. No, I, it's a whole different way of looking at things for sure. Yes, it is. And like I said, the first time that I went through the class and <laughs> the gentleman talked about this, uh, uh, both of us walked out and we were just, you know, you know, uh, it, it took a lot to grasp. And then I was actually shooting a wedding. I was uh, actually the second shooter. And I was photographing the bride, and I was uh, this was shooting with a Canon 10D, been a while back, and I was playing with it and uh, playing with you know photographing the dress and stuff like that. And I saw that when I really got the dress properly exposed, it was about two stops over, and the light bulb went off, and I I had it. And so from then I've been a huge advocate for the zone system and. Um, Again, still loving my incident meter. Uh, I normally carry it around my neck whenever I'm shooting portraits and stuff. Uh, it just makes your post-processing so much easier, faster, and the better your exposures are up front, the better your images will be even after post-processing. The more you have to adjust them, the more uh, noise you introduce into your image. Questions? Nothing? Okay. Okay, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> Where can we find more information on the zone system? Because oh, there's, there's tons of stuff that are out there, but I'll tell you, just like I told the folks at the North Georgia Club, and uh, by the way, Pat, you all sound great. I, I'm going to go ahead and sign up with you folks, too. Uh, in fact, I'm really interested in some of the night photography stuff. That sounds very interesting. Uh, but if anybody would like to go shoot, learn more about this, and have some actual hands-on, um, please uh, put my email address out to the team, out to the group. And just contact me. I'd be more than happy to go out and shoot with you and kind of show you some of this stuff hands on. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I love I love photography. Like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I taught for over 17 years at UNG. Um, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So if I can help anybody, uh, please contact me. Hi, Mike. Okay. I have a, a quick question for you. Okay. So let's say you're shooting a uh, a dark skinned bride in a white dress. If you're using spot metering on your camera, you would want her dress to be in zone two, so overexposed two stops, but you would want her face to be underexposed one stop. Is that correct? Yes, or thereabouts. But here's the thing. What's the most important thing at the wedding? The bride's face. The bride, right. So I'm going to expose off of her face, but what I'm also mm -hmm. going to be looking for are the blinkies, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make sure I've got my highlight warning on. I'm going to look for those blinkies, but I want to definitely make sure that her exposure is, is dead on. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then look at those blankies, make sure I don't have any problem. I can adjust for that a little bit in post-processing if I need to, but I wanna make sure that I really get her correct. 
Okay, so for this zone method, it really kind of almost relies on using spot metering mode in camera. I, I, either that or the other thing that I do is I actually take my camera and get right mm -hmm. in their face. Uh, <laughs> and I tell the people what I'm doing first because it mm -hmm. can be a little um, intimidating for someone to walk mm -hmm. right up to your face with a camera. In fact, I've had brides do silly things like they'll like they're picking their teeth or something like that. And I've got to be quick <laughs> on the trigger to get that if they do it. But uh, I'll tell, look, I'm going to get a meter reading off of you. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I've actually had people go, you know, no one's ever, no one else has ever done that. I said, well, it's just the way that I work. And it actually, as a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer, it makes you sound like maybe you know a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So it can also help you, your, you know, kind of what people would think as you're working with them, how they feel about it. Great, thank but you. Very good question. Mike? Yes. How, how do you incorporate the zone system into strobe flash photography? Um, not really, honestly. Uh, if I'm using strobe or flash photography, I'll use a flash meter. And I'll be working in the different ratios of what I'm trying to work with, whether I want something along in a lower ratio um, where I don't want really heavy shadows. Or if I want something really moody, then I will have heavy shadows. And that will depend on my fill light. Um, uh, I'm always working off my key light of for my main setting. So I'll get a meter reading off of that. Uh, but to be honest with you, a lot of times, uh, especially with the cameras and uh, the great flash stuff that's out today, a lot of stuff, if I'm working fast, I'll work TTL. And it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, I use the Godox system. And uh, it just comes out so great. Uh, and I'll just maybe do a little adjustment uh, on the power of my camera. Uh, I'll go down half a stop or up a you know, a half a stop to get it where I want it. And I'm doing that more visually. But if I'm not getting the look that I want, then I will switch to manual and get uh, my flash meter out. Thank you. You got any more questions? Mike, I've learned a lot. I don't know about the rest of them, but it's been very interesting. Well, thanks again. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, I'm